with you today on video. There has been a lot of technical difficulties uh, along the way, but now I can do this. There's several of you who have been able to keep supporting me while I preach and give me feedback. And now even though I can't see you, you can see me and it feels like we're closer together and we can do this through the video series. So hopefully I'll be able to keep this up. Um, and as I continue to preach, I just need to say that I'm not preaching because I'm getting paid to do it. I'm not preaching because um, an organization has asked me to. I'm preaching because I believe the Lord has called me to preach. Um, so as I, as I read the Word of God, as I study it, it's really good for me because I ask the Lord to show me what I need to learn, what I need to deal with, what I need to fix, and what He wants to do with me. And after He beats me up a little bit about it, and I learn things, and and find sin and find forgiveness and grace and grow through that and find knowledge and wisdom about the Lord, I, I articulate that and I share that with you. And I hope you're in this process with me uh, to become more like Christ, to know about God's word and to know more about our Father in heaven because that's, that's why this is happening. So if you are still listening, that means you must be interested in that. So let's not delay further and let's get into the book of James. going to be continuing our James study um, and go ahead and turn to chapter 1, but before I read our passage for today, I'd like for you to just imagine a scene with me, and it's the scene that James is going to paint for us in just a moment. So in this scene, I want you to imagine yourself in your bathroom, okay? This is your bathroom, okay? This is your bathroom, so I want you to see it like you would with, with your shower curtain going on the, on the tub over here, and your toothpaste stains in the sink, and you're in the shower, in the bathroom, <clears throat> and you're getting ready to go somewhere. You're getting ready to go somewhere important. Maybe this is on a date uh, with someone, and so you want to look nice for that. Maybe it's for like a job interview. I'm sure that every one of us has been in the bathroom, getting ready to go somewhere important when we wanted to look nice. So there's some work and maybe some attention to detail and getting, to, getting ready as we get ready to go out. So you're getting ready to go out and do this important thing. And you notice that there's a pimple, right? There's, there's a pimple on your face. And, and so you have a pimple problem. <laughs> That's what we're going to be talking about today in our passage. But you have a pimple problem and you need to do something about it. And, and we need to know a way to fix this problem. This is, this is a big deal. This is for, for, for guys, you know, we, we hate having pimples. For ladies, they hate having pimples. No one likes to go out to something even not important, but especially important with a pimple on our face. So I want you to hold that picture in your mind as we dig into our passage. And then before I read it one more time, I want to tell you what the application is from today's sermon. So you can have this in your head as we go through the passage. The application from today's sermon is that as a believer, as someone who is following Jesus Christ, if you've been saved from your sin, if you are following Jesus as your Lord and Master, the all-consuming priority of your life is to accomplish God's righteousness. Accomplishing God's righteousness. So James chapter 1, let's pick up our reading in verse 19. My dearly loved brothers, Understand this, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and evil, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save you. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his own face in a mirror, for he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. The one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. So the illustration I gave you with us in the bathroom, we're going to continue with that during this passage, but that, that means there's two things I want to explain to you before we keep going. And number one is the mirror... In your bathroom is God's word. It's the perfect law of freedom. The mirror in your bathroom is God's word. As we're, as we're in the bathroom 
getting ready. And then the other thing I want to ask you about, because we're going to ask this question today as we work through this passage, is it, why is it a big deal that someone would look in the bathroom, see something that needs to be fixed in the mirror, and not fix it and go it away? In EMS, uh, I had a partner and we had a great time working together. But sometimes if we had a patient with an, an especially minimal complaint, you know, maybe their leg's been hurting for five days, but they called 911 for it, and you're kind of like, uh, well, once we drop them off at the hospital, you know, we'd be real nice to them in the, in the ambulance, right? But once, once we dropped them off at the hospital, we would, we would maybe mimic their complaint, and then we'd say, but did you die? And, and but did you die was our favorite thing to say for these minimal complaints. And so kind of when I read this passage, I have a bit of that same feeling. All right, James, someone looked in the mirror, didn't see the or maybe did see what was wrong, but then they walked away without fixing it. But did they die? Is that catastrophic? Right? I don't want to I don't want to be in the middle of getting ready for something in the mirror and and I'm getting all my face put together to see a pimple. I don't want that to happen to me. But but if there's a pimple on my face and I leave is that a big problem? I, I do believe I understand why it's a problem, and so that's why I believe I have something to share with you today. So let's let's get down there to it, shall we? So the first thing I want us to see in this passage is we're in the bathroom getting ready. Jesus has to put us in the bathroom, okay? We don't get into this bathroom by ourselves. You and I, in our natural state, We'll never walk up into the bathroom, look into the mirror of God's word and examine ourselves and our own strength and our own power and with our own vision. In fact, if you'll go with me to Acts chapter 26, in Acts chapter 26, we get to see um, the Lord taking someone to the bathroom and putting their face in the mirror. In Acts chapter 26, Saul is on his road to Damascus, and, and many of you are familiar with this passage. But if I pick it up here in verse 16, it says this. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for a purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and of what I will reveal to you. I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles. I now send you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that by the faith in me they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified. So there's this idea that the Lord has to open our eyes to our sin. That's what the Lord did in a very dramatic way with Saul on the way to Damascus, who was then renamed Paul and became one of the greatest apostles and wrote several books in your New Testament. Jesus has to open our eyes to let us see what needs to be seen, to show us the work that needs to be done. And it's an interesting thing because there's an age-old debate, especially among unbelievers, and people won't go to church because they don't know how to answer this question. And the question is this, shouldn't I get cleaned up before I, I go to church? Shouldn't I get rid of the sin and the, and the, and the bad stuff before I, I call myself a Christian? And so people essentially wonder if you need to be clean to get the gospel. Let me just tell you right now, the gospel is what cleans us up. We don't get clean and then, and then find the gospel. The gospel finds us, and then Jesus does a work of cleaning and sanctifying in our hearts. In fact, in this passage, it says we need to make sure we're ridding ourselves of moral filth. Moral filth. I don't know what your moral filth is. I just know we're all contaminated with it. I know that we all have a sin nature. We all have a human nature. We're born, and like addicts to our sin, we go back to it. Even after we're made a new creature and we try to, we put off the old man and we're putting on the new man, we're letting Christ do his work in our hearts, we still go back to our sins. I don't know what yours is, but the idea is when you're in the bathroom and you're looking in the mirror, which is the, the perfect law of freedom, the word of truth, the gospel, when you're in that light, you take filth and you see it for what it is. And so maybe a sin that on TV wouldn't be considered a sin. Maybe something that a friend of yours would tell you is no big deal. Maybe when you look at the gospel, you see your sin for the moral filth that it is. And he says, you put it off. And I believe the reason James uses the words moral filth is because he wants us to think of filth. 
When we have filth on us, maybe some of you are parents like me, and you've changed a diaper and you come into contact with filth, or filth has gotten on you. It's not okay. We don't just sit there and look at it and go, oh, okay, and walk away with, with filth on us. The idea of removing, ridding ourselves and removing moral filth is this idea of straight up decontamination. Decontamination means a full working clean over. If I get filth on me, I know I, I kind of hastily maybe would get out of my shirt if it was on my shirt. And then I would spray some extra cleaning stuff on it before I put it in the washer. And then, then I'd crank it over to the hot water setting and I'd run it. And then I'd pull it out and I'd look at it. And if my shirt was still dirty when it was done, I'd throw it in and we'd do the same thing again. Maybe add some bleach in there or something. I know when I decontaminate an ambulance, I like to take everything out of that ambulance. I like to spray everything in the back of it with uh, stuff that will cause cancer, but boy, it'll kill all the germs and then you kind of power spray it all down you're using gloves you don't want any of the filth on you but as jesus takes us into the bathroom and helps us to look at the gospel and the word of truth we start to see ourselves for who we are we start to see what is on us for what it is we have to decontaminate also says we need to be swift to hear swift to hear and slow to anger for man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Anger's a anger's a tough nut to crack in the Christian life. We can have anger over pain that has been caused uh, to us, pain that has happened to us. We can be angry at watching someone else experience pain. We can be angry at a number of things. And anger is not something that just goes away when we become a Christian. There's there's such a thing as seeing something and being angered that that wrong seems to be triumphing in a situation but the bible tells us that anger does not accomplish god's righteousness our anger yours and my anger is as angry as we might be at an imperfect situation us being angry about it will not accomplish god's righteousness and so we we have to process our anger in the light of the gospel and, and this is not just an overnight experience. Many times, it's not going to be five minutes while we put off our anger. But if we recognize that our anger does not accomplish God's righteousness, and our priority is to accomplish God's righteousness, we understand that anger has, has no business in helping the situation or helping us get through the situation. We have to process that anger well. Maybe recognize some fears, some hurts, or vulnerabilities that lie beneath that anger and start working through those. But work, working through that anger with, with the light of the gospel, with, with the mirror of God's word there, will, will help us process it so that we can see God's righteousness accomplished. And as I got through part of this first passage, I keep see there's this picture where we're receiving the word of God and we're taking the things of, of our old self and, and we're putting them off. And we're putting on the new things. And we're like addicts to our sin. We, we just keep going back to it. But, but the Lord's power, the power of Christ, the gospel, can, can break the chains of our sin. And I thought, I need to introduce you to my friend. I need to introduce you to a friend of mine who can explain that experience uh, much better than I can. So, so I'd like you to hear from Doug Perry for just a moment. You're watching tonight. Uh, I want to... Shout out to my brother Joe for allowing me to be a part of uh, his sermon tonight. Uh, my name is Doug Perry. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I've struggled with drugs and alcohol in the past and, and codependency and many, many other issues. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ has rescued me. He, he, he rescued me in a jail cell. He met me right where I was. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of what Joe's doing tonight. Um, I'm just grateful for what Jesus Christ has done in my life. Joe is teaching tonight uh, from James chapter 1, uh, and he's asked me to share a little bit about verse 21 in James, and, and this is a New Living Translation, and it says, So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives, and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. I'm here to tell you, it has the power to save your souls. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In the 14th verse of John 1, it says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the Word. Uh, 
I I did recovery for many years. I tried to do recovery in in my own strength and in another program, but it it really didn't work because it's it's not about programs. It's about putting that higher power in in place, not just a higher power, but the higher power. And I want to share with you uh, some of the steps of Celebrate Recovery. I can only share uh, one through four with you and their biblical comparisons because I don't have much time. But in the first step, we admit. It says, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors and that our lives had become unmanageable. This is the biblical comparison. And it's found in Romans seven eighteen. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I wanted to change. I tried to change in and of myself, and I couldn't do it. And it wasn't until Jesus met me where I was in that jail cell that he gave me the power through his word to begin to change my life. In step two, we come to believe. We come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Paul writes in Philippians 2.13, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill, fulfill his good purpose. Just before that, he writes, he tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So what we do with that, while, while God's working it in, we work it out. And that's, that's about... <laughs> As plain as I can get about that. And in step three, we have to make a decision. Not just a plan or not just a resolution not to resolve to do it, but to make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. Paul writes this, Romans 12, uh, uh, 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. He goes on to say, do not conform any longer to the to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform. Don't be like the world. Be transformed. Get in the Word of God and allow it to move in your life. In Psalm 19, uh, I believe it's Psalm 19.9, it says that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. That word perfect also translates to the word complete. And I only become complete when Jesus Christ completes me. In, in step four, this is when we begin to take some actions for ourselves. And we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. It says, Lamentations 340, Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. I like to liken this to uh, Revelations 3.20, where uh, Jesus says, Behold, I'm standing at the door, and I'm knocking on the door of your heart. If you let me in, I'll come in and sup with you. I want to take that a little bit farther, and I want to tell you that Jesus wants to move in. He wants to get in the depths of your heart. And he wants to change things. He wants to throw out the old furniture and bring brand new stuff in. And that's not conforming. That's being transformed. And the only way we can do it is in God's Word. So as Brother Joe shares, uh, continues to share uh, uh, his sermon, remember this. Don't be just hearers of the Word. Be doers. Do what Jesus says. It's a very, very powerful thing. God loves you. He wants you. He leaves the 99 to find the one. I know I was one of those one. Let you yourself be one that is found by him. I thank you for allowing me to share. I love you, Joe. I love you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Doug, and I love you too. Doug is just one of the most Jesus-loving men I've ever met. I uh, love him to death. think he's great. I'm so glad he was able to share with you and me and encourage our hearts. Uh, it's this morning for me. I'm glad he was able to encourage our hearts with that. And, and Doug is right. And Doug is right. But as, as we come down to the end of this first point, I want to take what Doug says and I want to couple it with the thing that I want to stay in your head, which is the all consuming priority for all believers is to accomplish the righteousness of God. It's the all consuming priority. So we're in the bathroom getting ready. We know, we know that we're in the bathroom and we've looked at the mirror. But now, what are our goals? Okay, What are we getting ready for? Well, how do we get ready to, to go out of this bathroom and this work being done? Well, one of the goals of getting ready 
is it's found in verse 22. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So we all understand the principle of being a hearer and not a doer. You hear something, but you don't do it. The tricky part there is that James says the consequences we deceive ourselves when that happens. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be deceived. Because when we're deceived, when we're hearers and we're not doers and we're deceived, we're hypocrites. Now, if I asked you, do you like a hypocrite? You'd tell me no. If I asked you, will you name a couple hypocrites for me? You could probably name some. But the problem that James is getting to us is that we have a natural state of being hypocrites. So I have a three and a half year old daughter and, and I love my daughter and we're getting her potty trained and sometimes she'll go to the bathroom and when she's done, there's water all over the floor and all the toilet paper has been used up and it, it's kind of a wreck in there. So, so we will tell our daughter, we'll say, hey, all right, you can't use all the toilet paper when you go to the bathroom. Now, so, so we're in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic here, right? So, so maybe we're not hoarding toilet paper in my house, but we're certainly not spending it any faster than we have to. So I explained to our three and a half year old daughter, you can't use all the toilet paper when you go to the bathroom. I said, do you understand what I'm saying? And then in a really cute voice, she'll look up at me and she'll say, yes, daddy. And it's awesome. And then you'll be like, okay, you know, this kid, she gets it. She understands. And then she'll go into the bathroom. And the next time she uses the bathroom, there'll be water all over all the floor. And now maybe she's pulled some of the spare rolls of toilet paper down too. It's just toilet paper city in there. She's a hearer, not a doer. She heard me, but she doesn't do it. And if I asked her between bathroom trips, hey, are you going to use all the toilet paper? She'd be like, no, daddy, I'm not going to use all the toilet paper. All right. But she's a hypocrite. She's a sweet, adorable, cute little hypocrite. But you and I are hypocrites too. And what happens when we hear the word and we don't do anything about it, when we look in the mirror of the gospel and we don't do anything about it, we become hypocrites. And you and I do not want to become hypocrites. I want to be authentic and genuine in my faith. I want to know that what I tell people is the real deal. I want to be the real deal. But the only way to do that is to actually experience the gospel. Because I, I will point out that true belief results in action. If you see what's in your life for what it is, you can't not do anything about it. Having God's eyes on something requires an action and a change in our natural state. If we, if we hear the word of God and then we go away and we do nothing, my question is, were we ever really exposed to it? Were we ever really swift to hear that thing? Was there an active listening as we heard that passage? The second goal of getting ready in the bathroom is to accomplish God's righteousness because that's our all-consuming priority, right? That's, that's the second reason we're going to be getting ready in the bathroom. And I could take you to Isaiah 64, 6, and some of you know this passage. And what Isaiah says is that our righteousness, the human things that we do that are good works, are as filthy rags in the universe currency exchange. Filthy rags is what our righteousness is. And I don't know about you, but I want to be authentic in my faith, and I want to make a difference, and I want to take the love of Christ to people. But if I recognize that anything I do in my power, in my strength, in my way, will be just a filthy rag added to the mess, then I need God's righteousness, because mine isn't enough. And you and I, the reason we get ready, the reason we put off moral filth, the reason we're slow to anger and we're swift to hear, and we're doing all these things that are countercultural and counter nature, the reason we do this is because we recognize we need God's righteousness as we go out. When we leave this bathroom, what we've got won't cut it. We need what God has. Exposure to the truth has made us aware of our need for decontamination. That's another goal of getting ready. If you've been in the bathroom and you've looked in the mirror and you've seen what needs to be done, now you recognize a need to change. You recognize a need to change. And that's why it says we need to receive the implanted word. The implanted word is the gospel. The perfect law of freedom defined in this passage. We sit and we stare at the gospel. We look at the truth of what Jesus has done for us. And that's why I encourage you to be in your Bibles all the time. Read the Word of God. Have exposure to the Word of God. Sit in front of this mirror. Now, exposure to the Word of God. I touched on this before, but exposure to the Word of God, exposure to the Gospel, results in obedience. You can't see what God sees. 
You can't hear what he hears. You can't hear his truth and receive it and not change. And if, and if that can happen for you, then I would suggest you and Jesus need to sit down and talk. Ask him to take you to the bathroom for real. Ask him to take you in there because you know, you know, you know, you know when you've experienced the gospel. But when we experience the gospel, it results in obedience. We see things that need to be done and we, and we go do them out of a compulsion to accomplish God's righteousness, to, to behave in a manner consistent <clears throat> with what we've seen and experienced. Now the legalists will take this a different direction. Because maybe if exposure to the word of truth results in obedience, maybe if we're obedient to a bunch of laws, it will bring about truth or make something true. Well, that's not the case, my friend. We don't get to make up the truth. Just blind obedience and, and adding tasks and, and lists to your day isn't going to fix our problem. We have to have exposure to the truth, and then there's obedience. But trying to work the system backwards doesn't work. Another reason, another goal of getting ready is so that we can live in the fullness of what we receive. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I want to make sure I find the right verse here for you. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says this. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, there's a fantastic summary of the gospel, a summary of that word of truth we need to bathe in every morning. We need to stand in the light of each morning as we get ready to go out, but I don't understand how God can take someone full of moral filth and depravity with a human nature of being a hypocrite and can use us for God's righteousness. I know somehow it happens through Christ. <laughs> I know it doesn't happen through me. I know that somehow we go from this place of sinfulness to a place of God's righteousness and that Christ is the one that works the work that makes it possible. I don't know how it happens. I can't, I can't understand it. I can tell you that it's true. I can tell you that the Bible tells me it's happening. But I know this. If such a great thing is able to happen through Christ, I don't want to miss any of it. And I hope you don't want to miss any of it. Which is why, why stay in our puddle of moral filth if, if we can be God's righteousness? I want to be God's righteousness. And finally, our last goal of getting ready, and you, I hope you know what I'm going to say. The last goal of getting ready is that the all-consuming priority for every believer is to accomplish the righteousness of God. Now, right before we walk out that door, we've been in the mirror, we've been getting ready, we know our goals of why we're getting ready. We're going to go out. We're going to go do things. What are we going to do? We're going to go do our, our jobs. We're going to go do our hobbies, our pastimes. We're going to go run our errands. We're going to go interact with our families. We're going to go have relationships. We can't do any of those things without first going to accomplish God's righteousness. But right before we walk out that door, as we're looking in the mirror, man, as, as you're shaving that last line on your facial hair and getting it just right, you see a pimple. Ladies, as you're brushing back an eyebrow, oh, there's a pimple right there. Right before we go, we see we have a pimple. <clears throat> and we have a choice. The person in James's passage sees that pimple, forgets about it, and just walks out the door. Don't be that person. And I asked myself, but did you die? What's the problem with leaving that pimple there? And I'll tell you, it's what the pimple is. The pimple in this passage today is that when we gaze on the gospel and the word of truth and the perfect law of freedom, you and I will see that accomplishing God's righteousness is not our all-consuming priority. That's what we see. We look in this law and we recognize that there are a hundred other agendas in here. There are a hundred other things we want to do. But accomplishing God's righteousness is not the all-consuming priority. That is the pimple on our face. And we have a choice. We can either seek the cure for that problem. We can seek the cure for that problem and go out and accomplish God's righteousness. Or we can forget it all and we can walk away and let the devil win for the rest of the day. See, James 
points it out at the beginning. I didn't read it this way, but if I was reading this passage in the way it was written, it would go like this. My dearly loved brothers, understand this, right? There's a, there's a listen up there. There's a pay attention call. James has something really important to tell us. What he has to tell us is that you and I have a pimple problem and that accomplishing God's righteousness it sometimes doesn't even hit our radar. We are the kids in the bathroom. We are the hypocrites. We are the, the doers. We are, we are the hearers that don't do. In fact, all of us have this natural tendency, but can I just throw a side note in here for you to pray for your church leaders? Your church leaders are in a really rough spot. Because they've got a congregation of people that look to them to be the perfect, awesome, Jesus-following example. And, and hopefully we all strive to be a Jesus-following example. But they're in a tough place where sometimes if they do wrong, they're kind of judged funkily for it. Or, or it doesn't go well, or they have this pressure and the devil gets to them. And so they, they tend to become hypocrites because doing it becomes risky. I'll never forget, I had a conversation with a church leader one time. And I don't think I've ever seen as much hostility on a man's face as when I suggested that church leaders need to take the gospel, apply them to their own relationships before ever daring to ask their congregation to do the same. This church leader told me, that offends me. and offended him that we would do that. Well, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, in our natural state, any kind of doing the work of the gospel offends us. That's what happens. We are naturally hypocrites. We don't want to go do the word of God. We just want to hear it and forget it and walk away because it is risky to start changing things. We are the kids in the bathroom, just like my little daughter. We're going to go back and we're going to go make a mess again. Now, I will tell you this, though. Jesus forgives hypocrites. And if you and I, there's hope because if we will hear and receive and be swift to hear, there's that active listening. We're reaching for the word of God. And then we'll go do the things that we see in the mirror. We'll, we'll wash our faces where we see the dirt. We're not hypocrites. We're now we're doers of the word. That's what James is exhorting here. And as I read this passage, as I prayed through the passages, I asked the Lord to tell me what it was I needed to learn. I, I have to just say for a minute, can I, can I look at you for a moment, fathers? Can I encourage you, fathers, to set the example here for your children? Can I encourage you that taking your family to church once a week is not enough? It's not even close to enough? That you need daily exposure to the word of truth. You need to be daily influenced by the gospel in a powerful and meaningful way. Fathers, too many of our children look at their dads and know that we're hypocrites. They know that we can go to church with them on Sunday and laugh and joke with the other men and then we can come home and we can, we can cuss all night in the garage working on the car. Our children know us as hypocrites, fathers, because we do not do the word. We don't even sit in the bathroom long. We laugh off our problems. As dudes, we have big pride problems. And ladies, I know you got your sets of issues. And I'm not going to talk about those today because I am specifically burdened for fathers. You need to get that figured out. Ladies, I don't think you want a pimple on your face. <laughs> I've got more faith in you that you want to wash it off than us guys. We will, we will let it ride. But we should all be worried about our pimple problem. And it's funny because it says, in meekness, we need to receive the implanted word. In humility, we receive the gospel. What we learn in the mirror doesn't get to be weaponized, folks. That's why I'm telling you today something I've learned because this is my problem. And I know it's your problem because I knew it was my problem first. But in meekness, we need to receive the word. And I'll tell you what that means is that we're not the pimple doctors for the rest of our friends. We don't get to say, oh, he's got a pimple, let me pop it. She's got a pimple, let me pop it. We get to say, I have a pimple and I need to pop it. Say, Does anybody else want to go pop some pimples with me? Does anybody else want to make accomplishing God's righteousness the all-consuming priority of our lives? And I will tell you that when a bunch of people will get together and accomplishing God's righteousness is the all-consuming priority of their lives, powerful things will happen. That's what the kingdom of God is. People talk about the kingdom of God as if it's a mystical thing. It's not. The kingdom of God is simple. It is you and it is me knowing and living like God is our king. God's our king. He's on the throne. His righteousness is our priority. And when you and me sit together in the same room and he is our king and we are his kingdom dwellers, there it is. There's the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a powerful thing. 
The only cure for our pimple is exposure to the word, exposure to the gospel. You cannot come in contact with Jesus' love, his forgiveness, his grace. You cannot come in contact with the perfect law of the Bible and not see your pimple. So go sit. Ask Jesus to take you to the bathroom and sit you down in front of that mirror. And don't walk out the door. Don't leave your devotions. Don't set this down until whatever you do for the rest of the day is secondary to accomplishing the righteousness of God.